Well, let's get some more on that story now with Matthew Shribman, Chief Scientist at Aim High Earth, an organisation that offers training and education on climate issues. Uh, great to see you, Matthew, this evening. Thanks for your time. So, a new Labour government in Australia wanting to turn round Australia's reputation when it comes to uh, the climate. Are you hopeful? Um, so, well, first, maybe it's good for me to start with some, some context on, on, on my feelings around this at the moment. So life on earth at the moment is is dying at an astounding rate we've lost six in ten insects in the uk in just 20 years the oceans are emptying out the big fish are down 90 percent over the last century or so animals with spines are down around 70 percent seven in ten of all animals with spines down on on the entire of the planet life on our planet is being obliterated and its obliteration is increasingly likely to take us with it, yet there's still this suggestion that we should be saying well done for these kinds of performances, which by all means, uh, it's certainly moving in the right direction. I really don't want to say that, um, that this isn't progress, because of course this is progress, but we're still at the stage where we're looking at, we're at a performance like the, this, this new announcement, which is ultimately degrade in that, yes, there's some renewables mixed in there, but we cannot open any more uh, we, we, we cannot keep keep running with coal and fossil fuels. We are into the end game now. We're very likely to lose everything. We have to give it our all or it just simply won't be enough. So like two um, quotes maybe to contextualize this for you. One of them is direct from the IPCC. It says, species extinction, um, widespread disease, unlivable heat, ecosystem collapse, and cities menaced by rising sea levels will become painfully obvious before a child born today turns 30. Um, another one from PNAS, uh, over the coming 50 years, around 3 billion people are projected to be left outside of survivable uh, climate conditions. And then you can add to that another two thirds of a billion um, that will be under the, the high tide but, mark. And I guess, so we can't really, oh, of course, I, go on. Yeah, sorry, Matthew. I, I mean, I, I, we, we all get how serious the situation is and, and there's no denying that we are uh, in, in a desperate place at the moment. But having said all that, we should give credit where credit's due to those who are attempting to do something. And when you, when you listen to Anthony Albanese pledging to reduce Australia's greenhouse gas emissions by 43%, I mean, that's a massive cut um, uh, compared to the previ previous administration's target of 26 to 28%, we should at least say, yes, very much heading in the right direction, um, uh, shouldn't we? I mean, you, you, you must have a bit of positivity around that. I, I very much used to be more of this viewpoint of saying, yes, we, we should be really positive about, about these, these things that are moving in the right direction. But ultimately, now the reality is so stark that anything less than giving this our all is an abject failure. Unfortunately, that, that, that's the scientific reality. So what <laughs> does Australia need to be doing then? What would you say Australia needs to be doing? So, um, I mean, Australia needs to needs to completely cut out coal within the space of of years. They need they need to be. So, if we, if we look at the the language of the um, of of the COP process, so every year there's this, or, or many years there's this COP meeting that tries to put in place rules to try and establish uh, what we're going to do next. Um, Every year they say something like, we must peak emissions and it must happen in five years' time, it must happen in three years' time, it must happen in two years' time. We had people saying in around 2012 that it must peak in the next two or three years. It, emissions are still going up. And so every piece of coal that we burn is emissions still going up and still going into the atmosphere. So anything less than stopping immediately is still making things worse. And so these levels of ambitions are nowhere near high enough, which is why you have people like Antonio Guterres, who's obviously the, the head of the UN, the most important global body on earth, saying climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals. But the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. Investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure is moral and economic madness. Now, of course, he's referring to, to new infrastructure, but implicit in that is the ongoing extraction of, of infrastructure, is the ongoing use of infrastructure that already exists. I Australia... suppose part of the problem, I, I, I mean, it's interesting you, you say that because part of the problem is, you know, the situation we all find ourselves in now, Australia's uh, no exception, you know, a cost of living crisis, uh, inflation, uh, a, a real problem. And with so many people employed in that industry, 90% of Australia's black coal is exported, uh, a huge part of the the Australian economy. Yes, they, they say we have to do something, we will do something, we're having this huge shift to renewables, but at the moment people uh, need to put food on their plate. You can't just switch it off like that. 
You know, there's this um, paper by this economist called William Nordhaus. It's called DICE, the Dynamic Integrated Climate and Economy Model. Um, and it's been used quite a lot to kind of weigh up uh, the benefits of, of uh, taking climate action versus the benefits, the, the benefits of not taking that action because, you know, people can continue making money out of fossil fuels. And this paper has been debunked multiple times by the top climate scientists in the world. And yet, um, William Nordhaus, has, he's won a Nobel Prize. And so it's, it's become incredibly influential and it's really influenced politicians into thinking that it's reasonable to carry on this in this direction where they're thinking about balancing costs. But ultimately, it comes down to a really fundamental misunderstanding of the science and the urgency. So you ask about the cost of living crisis, and of course, this is really bad, but it's also going to get worse. It's going to get worse due to multiple factors, like shipping, for example, at the moment is incredibly clogged because our system is overly optimized. Um, but anyway, um, it's going. the main reason why it's uh, going to get... <laughs> the, the cost of living crisis is going to be completely dwarfed by the costs that will be borne out if we do not do something about this in a much more extreme way much sooner. It's, <laughs> you have scientists everywhere now taking to the streets, actually like gluing themselves to buildings, desperate to get people to understand that we need a world war scale mobilization of our resources to bring down fossil fuels. I, I don't see that anywhere. I don't know if you see that, but that, that's not what I see. What I see is an Australia that's continuing to export mm. this product when Australia, as we know, is one of the, I think it's maybe in the top two or three of the most emissive countries on earth in terms of its emissions per person in the country. So it's already one of the worst defenders. Surely it can afford to come down. It's a very wealthy country and it can afford to, to, um, to, to redistribute wealth because at the moment so much wealth is, con is, is concentrated in the billionaire class. Surely it can afford to redistribute wealth in order to begin solving this problem. Yeah, much, much work to be done. Okay, uh, we must leave it there. We're out of time. Matthew Shridman, uh, Chief Scientist at AIM High Earth. Thank you.